Today's episode is going to bring natural products back to the forefront. Maybe you haven't thought about this in a while. Maybe you think that this is not a space that is as active for pharma anymore, but hopefully by listening today, you'll hear that's not the case. Hi, Paula. I'm so excited to welcome you today as a guest on the OMG OMX podcast series. I'm so excited for you to be able to share your story with our audience. And you have a common trait that many of our guests have had, that you have a diverse start to your career, and it has led to such curiosity in science. Can you tell us about your story and how you got to your current position? Yeah, um, well, hey, Kate, um, thank you for having me on, and I'm uh, excited to be here. Um, so I actually started off uh, studying analytical chemistry, and during my undergrad, I had a chance to, uh, to intern at some really cool labs. And, um, you know, in, in one of the labs, I... I um, sort of rotated that they uh, they had reprogrammed some some Gilson auto samplers to allow for temperature controlled fractionation of snake venoms while acquiring mass spec. So that was, that was really cool. And another lab I, I worked at, um, we we're studying cell signaling networks in endothelial cells by by mapping phosphorylation events. And I think what always struck me about how creative about that was how creative people were. And I was, you know, simultaneously I think I was intrigued by the, the puzzles that came along with, you know, doing mass spec research of, of piecing together molecules based off of these, these, uh, these fragments. So I guess um, during my master's and while I was working at CU Boulder, I started getting into like some 3D printing, a little bit of like electrical engineering. And I was, uh, I was building little devices to kind of help myself like, uh, like automate and, and speed up my work. Um, and, uh, then in early 2021, I ran into one of the, the founding members of Inveda Biosciences, and uh, you know, he was asking around the, the mass spec facility at CU to see if he could run some samples there. And you know, at that point, Inveda was just getting started. Um, older, so he saw one of my little creations there, and he wanted to talk to me. And then you know, we met over Zoom, um, and the next thing I knew, I was working part time at Inveda. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, Inveda had just was just building out their lab. And, and all we had at that point was basically an empty building with a couple pallet racks along the walls. So, you know, joining at such an early stage, I think, allowed me to get really creative and, you know, quickly throw together these custom devices to try and pilot some of the ideas that we had. Um, and now, you know, it's two and a half years later and we have two fully built out labs and we're just two months away from moving into a, a brand new facility. So, um, you know, from the start, I was really focused on the problem of like pinpointing bioactive compounds in, in complex mixtures of natural products. And now I, you know, I'm, I'm leading the, the team that's doing that. I'm a, I'm a senior scientist leading the team that uh, focuses on finding bioactive features uh, together with a wonderful team of chemists and biologists and data scientists. So I know that you're really kind of a tinkerer. You like to, to take things, you like to improve on a system, um, whether it be with mechanical um, or industrial adaptations. But do you have any OMG moments that maybe pop out at you from your training or from early on with Inveda? Um, so I, I think I think my my OMG moment that really got me started, um, you know, in the field of mass spec was during my undergrad when I when I interned at the, the VU University in Amsterdam. Uh, my project was to basically they kind of let me loose on trying to isolate this antimicrobial compound from a, a bacterial supernatant, and it was you know it was really active against tuberculosis, so it was potentially really you know really um, valuable compound. So I, I started off with some methods that were already set up in the lab. Um, but I was basically just taking these fractions by hand and spotting them on agar plates and looking for growth inhibition that way. But, you know, in the same lab, they were running these really sophisticated three to four well-played assays on snake venoms. And they were looking at inhibition of like, you know, blood coagulation and, and muscle contraction and stuff like that. So, you know, I looked around at those assays and I was, I was looking at my, my little antimicrobial assay. And I was like, but, you know, I, I want to do that, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I, I was pretty determined to scale that assay to, uh, to well place and and so I found this like little metabolic dye, and uh, I, I kind of dialed in the the, the seeding density of these bacteria. And at some point, I was looking at my my results, and I I had this beautiful like bioactive trace that I could then correlate to the mass spec signal. And I I think that's that's when it kind of clicked for me that 
you know, there were these really sophisticated analytical techniques that could be used to find the sort of the bioactive needle in the haystack. I think that was my, my OMG moment. I was like, you know, that's where I sort of fell in love with, with solving these puzzles by combining biological assays with, with mass spec. So we've mentioned Inveta a couple of times. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how it fits into the natural product space, how vast this is, and really what the mission and the goals behind the company are. Yeah, so you know, natural products are really just the compounds found, you know, that are produced by by living organisms. And you know, in Veda, we, we focus very heavily on plants. Um, but you know, these compounds like like terpenes and alkaloids and flavonoids, um, there's there's such a wealth of different molecules found in plants that um, conservative estimates put it in you know the, the billions of different compounds. So. Uh, you know, we know how to analyze some of these molecules, especially the larger ones, things like, like proteins and DNA and RNA, because they're very predictable. They have kind of predictable repeating units. But when you think about the, you know, small molecule natural products, it becomes a lot harder to, to characterize and identify because their, their building blocks are really just, you know, the base elements that make up organic molecules like, you know, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, et cetera. So, you know, for many years and really to this day, still the, the process of identifying new small molecules is uh, really painstaking because, you know, you have to you have to spend a lot of time extracting and purifying and then, you know, isolating these compounds to get them on NMR, really to get any kind of shot at identifying them. And, you know, because of this, I think in the, in the natural products world, maybe only around 1% of all natural products are, are known across biodiversity. But what's really amazing is that, you know, despite that fact, the, you know, natural products are still a very large portion of the, you know, the drugs that are on the market and the medicines that we use, um, you know, somewhere between a third to half of all medicines we use, you know, still are derived from natural products. So, at Inveda, we we believe that the the ninety nine percent of unknown natural products presents this huge like untapped wellspring of potential new medicines, and you know we're developing technologies, uh, many of which rely very heavily on mass spec, to go from this you know old one by one strategy to a like a massively parallel industrialized discovery approach, and and really our ultimate goal is to speed up the discovery of that next generation of impactful medicines, um, you know, from the natural world that can help improve people's lives. So how does mass spec help with that? How does a high throughput manner help with that? And and what do you need to be able to accomplish all of this? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. The field of mass spec has really evolved a lot over the, over the years. And, you know, some of the most significant improvements that have been made have been in the, the speed of acquisition of MSMS spectra. And this has largely been driven by the, the field of proteomics where, you know, more MSMS spectra means more peptide IDs and you get more extensive uh, coverage of the proteins. And I think you guys at Brooker have made some, some valuable contributions to that in recent years. Um, but really what that has also enabled has been the sort of high throughput acquisition of these unique molecular fingerprints that represent, you know, the compound and that MSMS spectrum, the fingerprint is in many ways, it's an expression of that molecule structure. So really, I mean, in, in drug discovery and in medicinal chemistry, the structure is, is basically everything. Like, you know, there's not a single medicinal chemist that you can talk to that doesn't want to first see the structure before they'll say anything else about a molecule. Um, but, you know, with, with MSMS spectra, it's almost like, you know, that fingerprint, that structural representation is written in a different language. And it's very it's one that's very hard to translate. So, you know, for anyone who's tried uh, de novo structural elucidation from MSMS spectra, it's, it's a very slow and painstaking process. Um, and, you know, that problem is really important for us because, you know, not only are we dealing with small molecules, but we're dealing with this like vast chemical dark space that, you know, that 99% of undiscovered natural products where something like a library lookup doesn't do you any good. Um, so instead, we were opting for a, a more machine learning based approach to sort of try and learn the language of MSMS spectra. So we've, you know, we've created a, a generative AI model that we've trained on, on the language, you know, the grammar of MSMS spectra in a similar way that machine learning models can translate now between you know, really any two languages that you can think of. Um, but using that same architecture, the same architecture as, as large language models like, like ChatGPT that, you know, and other models that have been popping up recently, our model, ms 2 mo is actually able to predict structures from MSMS spectra um, that we collect during LCMS runs um, of, of these complex plant extracts. So, 
and you know it's it's not like it's giving you the exact structure for every single compound in that run that would be great but we're not quite there yet um, but what it is doing is it's giving us a, a very useful representation of that molecule in the sense that we get a lot of information about the base structure and the the most important functional groups of that molecule and what that does is it gives our um our medicinal chemists right our drug hunters a, a, a shot at you know assessing whether molecules are worth um pursuing right because that that process of actually isolating and finding that molecule is extremely time consuming and you know it takes a lot of time and effort to to do that so so i think where where we have a unique advantage because of this this um this model is that we get to decide beforehand whether it's worth pursuing these molecules so maybe tell me a little bit more. I'm kind of naive on the natural product space. So where are you getting these samples? I mean, I'm, I have this picture in my head now of you guys out in jungles and go, going through like the old movies used to show. But what's the realistic view of how you're finding where to look in this space? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think we all wish that we got to go to the jungle and <laughs> and you know with our machetes and go and find uh, go and find medicinal plants that no one's seen before, but. Really, in reality, there's there's a there's a really rich history of of uh, medicinal plants being used for medicine, you know. And uh, what very early on in Invis history, we were combing through literature, you know, looking for indications that certain plants might work for certain diseases. Um, so really, that's where that's kind of where it started. We had this this concerted effort to source very specific plants, but you know, over time, we've actually expanded it to really as many plants as we can get our hands on. Um, and we're just expanding our library um, to, to really cast as wide a net as possible because the, the thing we're now really investing in is, um, you know, the, the, the platform that can identify those bioactive molecules regardless of what the source is. Do you have any fun facts of history that you've learned along the way? If you've been looking into ancient uh, medicines and practices, I'm just curious if anything else has come up. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess... One one story that our that our CEO told very early on was that you know when he was he was he grew up in India and when he was living there he had you know he had some some issue with his liver that was causing jaundice and you know he uh, went to all kinds of doctors and at some point one of his family members basically uh, you know recommended this herbal medicine to cure it and you know I think he was probably skeptical at first, but then he took it and it just went away. And, you know, that's one of those, one of those moments where like, we know something's happening there. Right. And it sounds like almost like a miracle cure. Right. But in reality, the, there's, there are so many bioactive compounds in these plants, right. We observe them every day. Um, we just don't know what they are. Right. That's the mystery. Uh, so we just don't know what we're looking at, but, but we know there's something there. So I, I think that's, that was, you know, that was really interesting to hear that there's this, that, that firsthand experience that really is what, what got in beta started too. Yeah. Thank you for that. Maybe I can pull us back to um, more of what your experiences are. So tell me a little bit more on moving things towards industrialization. How have your education, your past experiences helped you to foster that and to bring that into your workspace? Yeah. So I think while I was working at SCU Boulder, um, I, was, I was studying the signaling pathways in, in melanoma using phosphoproteomics, and these were fairly involved experiments. Um, and I had already learned Python just to deal with the, the amount of data I was getting. Um, but, you know, as my experiments got more extensive and elaborate, I it got into a little bit of like 3D printing and tinkering to try and streamline the actual, you know, the physical experiments themselves. So I, you know, I was doing things like printing little tube racks that would space these little tubes exactly for a multi-channel to get in there and stamp it to a well plate, you know, stuff like that, just to make my life easier. And another thing I did is I built a little fraction collector off of this cheap CNC mill off of Amazon, um, which funny story. So I actually, I thought it was going to be a tough sell. So I actually bought it with my own money. And then, <laughs> and then I made it and then I showed it to my PI and I was like, look at this thing I made. And then she was like, wow, that's really cool. And I said, do you think he can reimburse me for it though? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she did, of course. Um, but, but yeah, that's kind of, that's, that was the angle I took, you know, um, because, you know, we were on an academic budget, so we couldn't always be spending hundreds of dollars here and there. But I think one particular set of experiences that has really taught me maybe the most about industrializing processes and organizing teams was actually at the start of the pandemic and 
And this was right around the time, it was a couple of months after I'd gotten into 3D printing and I got a 3D printer at home. And, um, but there was this, you know, at the start of the pandemic, I'm sure everyone recalls, there was this, uh, this big shortage of PPE. You know, all these doctors and nurses were going without, um, you know, face masks and face shields and they had to reuse stuff. So, you know, these groups started to pop up all over the country and really all over the world. Uh, of people who owned, you know, 3D printers who were printing these little brackets for face shields, right? And they were getting, you know, little sheets of acrylic um, cut, laser cut to form the, the front. And I, and I thought, you know, why, why don't I do some of that too? So I, I reached out to a bunch of people kind of in the area um, and organized this little group of people with 3D printers. And, you know, we made a little GoFundMe page and uh, we raised some money to buy filament and, uh, and these acrylic sheets. Um, and we probably, I think we made probably a couple hundred before this big, larger group started popping up in the area um, called Make for COVID. And uh, it was this really incredible group of, of tinkerers and engineers that were, you know, that were all coming together to, to you know, towards, to work towards this one goal of, of getting more PPE, PPE out there to the people that needed it. So I think it was a Milo group joined up with them and we started contributing our prints, but, you know, the, the organization of it was really remarkable because, you know, they had a, they had a, everything organized in a Slack channel, and people were sharing tips about ways to you know, not only print these brackets but increase the throughput of them. You know, print them faster, print them better, more at a time. Um, and, and you know, it was is really just just the goal was like the more face shields we make, the more people we can help. Um, so you know, at some point they had a dedicated drop off spot that we would deliver these these prints to, and anyone could print stuff at their house and deliver it there. And they even, you know, they were, they had people driving them to various hospitals in the area. And they even at some point they had the Colorado Mountain Rescue Team flying them to rural areas in Colorado that were hard to get to, right? That would have been you know several hours uh, driving. So I, I think our, our group probably ended up contributing something like 1,500 of these of these face shields, but across the whole organization, it must have been in the, the tens of thousands. Um, but I think that what that what that really taught me was that you know that kind of concerted effort of you know a group of people, very smart people, all focused on you know one singular goal of creating something that can that can help people. That's that can be incredibly powerful. And you know when I look around at at Inveda, I think I see a very similar thing. Right, we have an incredible group of very smart people that are all working together towards this one common goal of, you know, finding these new medicines to help people and to improve their lives. It's really touching to hear the connections that you're able to make with your coworkers, but also during the pandemic. I mean, it, it, it's such a form, formative experience for so many of us um, as we've moved into careers or, or things like that. So thank you for being a good human. It's always nice to hear a story like that. Maybe I can Continue on by by just asking, as you've grown within Inveda, how has watching and helping them grow been similar or dissimilar to academia? You've now experienced both sides of that. Yeah, it's it's, it's actually interesting. So startups are kind of unique in that in that sense. You know, it's, it's not just in, industry as usual. Um, I, th- I think what startups really do is they they combine a lot of good aspects of both industry and academia because you know. In academia, you have all this 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 sort of freedom to do really creative work and and really um, focus on doing good science, you know, all the time. Um, and we do we do a lot of that. Um, but then you also get a lot of the benefits of industry, where you know you have very organized projects that have like managers and leaders, and you have access. You know, at some point in a startup, you have access to a lot of funding for for cutting edge equipment. So it's actually funny. It's like when we get our Series A fundraise, this was in, I think, June of 2021. We we're all super excited because, you know, it was like the most money in beta ever had. Um, but we also really quickly realized that, you know, the one thing that was perhaps even more valuable than that money was the time that we had to do something with it. So um, really, I mean, it's, it's a very fast paced environment. But I think that's one of the things that I probably enjoy the most about working here is, is, uh, is you know, we got it. We got to keep moving. There's nothing slowing us down. Um, and, and really there's such an opportunity to, if you, if you're good at finding ways to do something fast, but also very well, then, you know, it's going to be really good in a, at a startup. So kind of related to that, how do you find your, your time management? I imagine that you've got your hand in a lot of different projects and pies and how do you keep all of that going and keep that balanced? Yeah, I, I like to, I like to keep myself sort of spread across, as you know, several different projects. Um, I sometimes I notice when one project slows down, or if you know, if we're waiting for something to arrive and 
can't really do anything with it. It almost like feels like I don't know what to do with that extra time that I have, even though I have like four other projects to work on. But I think what, what, what it also does is, you know, if I, if I get stuck on something because I'm, you know, splitting myself across so many different things, there's always something that'll happen eventually that'll kind of, that'll kind of, uh, you know, shake things loose in my mind. And then I'll go, Oh wait, maybe I should try that. And then I'll, and I'll be back on track. So I, so I like to keep a, you know, a very controlled amount of chaos in my, um, <laughs> in my work day, but, you know, for the purposes of moving all the projects that I'm on forward. So. Since you are in that fast paced environment and you do have a lot of pressure, do you ever get innovation block or iteration block or science block? And, and how do you, how do you um, deal with that and get back on track? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think it is just because I'm on so many different projects. There's always something to do. Um, you know, if I'm really stuck on something, I always just focus on the other other things I have going on. And yeah, I I, I I haven't yet run into an issue where I just could not continue. I think I always end up getting inspired somehow. Um, and I, you know, it helps that I have so many really smart people around me that have such a such a diverse set of experiences because there's always someone I can ask you know, who I know has some background in whatever I'm working on. So I, th- I think I rely on my, my colleagues very heavily in that regard. You know, I, if, if I'm, if I'm thinking about, you know, isolating small molecules, we have a fantastic group of chemists. If I'm thinking about, you know, biological pathways and what the, what the results might mean, we have a, we have a fantastic group of biologists. So there's always someone to ask. Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a, a big benefit of working at, at Inveda. So it seems like one thing that Inveda has done really well is to, to bring in house the things that you need to be successful in the natural product space. Some of the machine learning that you brought on board, the industrialization. So what else do you need, do you think, for this to be a, a long-term venture and to be replicated out there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because um, I think I think one of the ways we've now, so, so we're a bit of an outlier in the sense, you know, in the, in the, in the larger pharma picture, in the sense that we are we are the ones going after natural products when the field has largely been moving away from that, um, and I think I think the the way we're we're succeeding in that space is that we you know in addition to our, our predictive model MS two mole that we we also have we have built lots of of tools internally um, in the form of just organizing our data in a way that we have a central database called in beta search where we combine all of our, our mass spec data, our bioactivity data, and our, um, you know, our, our structure and property predictions. Um, and, and, you know, because, because we've sort of organized our data in that way, our, our medicinal chemists can really easily sift through it and look for new leads. So I don't, I don't think we've ever had a moment where we were all just going, well, what, you know, what next? I mean, there's, there's always m- way more things to chase than we have time to chase them. So um, I think, you know, with that much, uh, with that much good data and with that much, there's such a density of, 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 um, of discoveries, you know, internally that I don't think, I don't think we, we would ever um, <laughs> not have enough leads to chase. I think that's the thing that keeps us successful is that we, we, uh, you know, we, we always have something to pivot to. If whatever project doesn't work out, we've got a million other things lined up. Lined up. So it's, you know, <laughs> until we start running out of stuff to do, I think I think we're in, we're in good shape. Yeah, and that's just good science. I assume that every question you ask leads to 10 more at least, just like any good oh, yeah. academic researcher. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Pelly, it's been so great to chat with you. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about your professional journey. Um, You've given us a little bit of overlap with your personal hobbies, like 3D printing. Um, And, you know, you're not the only one who took this up. I I have to say, though, I started after the pandemic. And maybe it's a good thing I didn't try and do any PPE printing because I have something to show you if that's all right. So this is this is my attempt, my not so very good attempt. Can you see how melted (laughs) it looks? This is my Tim's Top SCP. Um, I think I have a little bit to learn as far as 3D printing goes. so maybe, I don't know, do you have anything uh, better than this and that you could tell us something about? And I'll just put this away over here. So, so I didn't make this myself, but <clears throat> I have I have printed these these uh, these protein structures before. But actually, one of the rotation students at, uh, that I that I kind of you know worked with um, at CU Boulder, he uh, he had worked on Ubiquitin before. And uh, as a parting gift, you know, when this rotation was over, he gave me this this little print of a Ubiquitin protein. He even painted it for me. But uh, 
yeah, that's that's you know, I actually printed printed a couple versions of uh, of Irk two. That was what we worked on, and you know, the, my my PI would always say like, you know, you never you never really understand a protein until you can hold it in your hand. So that was the <laughs> that was the 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 utility of it was was uh, you know she really liked kind of holding that protein and and being able to look oh there's the binding pocket you know stuff like that. But yeah, I also have a <laughs> my business card holder is actually this. It's Very a lower nice. jaw. It's a human lower uh-huh. jaw. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, awesome. That's where I keep my business cards, my Rolodex. That's good. You know, I took a step back and I decided I'm going to go simpler. So I just made myself a little fidget joystick because I was like, Oh, there you go. My, uh, my, uh, my Tim Soft is not where my skills lie. So we're going to keep it. For, small. You know, the general rule in 3D printing is for every useful thing you can make, there's about 100, you know, generally useless prints that you can make, <laughs> like little octopuses with flexible yeah. arms and stuff yeah. like that. That's really like, that's that's the thing that people really like about 3D printing. And, and you know, it is fun. It is fun to, fun to make. Pella, it's been so great chatting with you. I always enjoy hearing about people's professional journeys. You've given us some overlap into your hobbies, such as 3D printing. I'm really so glad that you were able to share some of this with us today. And thank you again for speaking with us. Thanks again for joining us today. If you'd like more information about Inveda or to hear more from Pella, please feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn. 